All right, folks, so it's been just a little bit of a while since uh, I made my last video, but I've had some rather unfortunate life events uh, take place uh, in the past uh, month or so. So, um, you know, kind of put the whole mood for making videos a little, little, little bit lower. So, but we carry on regardless of what happens. So uh, what I want to share today is something that's been in the works for a little bit. Um, got a lot of inspiration from a friend of mine because... Uh, well, actually a few friends of mine, but uh, mostly one friend who uh, had told me and uh, extolled the virtues of the M16A1, the A1 style of rifle, and how it's so much better than the A2 and the A4. And uh, me not having any experience with A1 rifles, because that was, you know, definitely uh, before my time. Um, I mean, I did qualify in the M16A2, and that was one of the last classes to ever do that, or last uh, basic trainings for Air Force to use the M16A2. Uh, nowadays, of course, the, the, the new kids don't use M16s at all uh, in the Air Force anyways. So um, anyway, the A1 is definitely something that was before my time, but it is, you know, the, the, like one of the first iterations of the M16 for the U.S. military. So uh, I decided to put some parts together because well, years ago, I mean, like before I even, I even got this house, like I just got into my new apartment and stuff. Uh, I was looking up surplus stuff and, and uh, I found a all original surplus uh, furniture kit for A1s. Uh, so I had that lying around for I don't know how many years. And I, I figured, you know what? Now that the whole like retro scene is, is kind of coming back and you know Brownells had their, their run of um, the retro rifles and things, I figured it was probably high time uh, to, to go ahead and just make my own because my, my buddy was really telling me like how great the, the A1 was. So we're gonna be covering my A1 build here, as you can see. And this is the all original furniture that I was talking about earlier. This is absolutely some uh, Vietnam era surplus stuff. Now this is a older, I guess they call the type D stock that doesn't have the, um, what do you call it? The trap door here in the butt stock. And uh, it's still got some of the original rubber on here, but it is, it is cracking uh, a little bit. Um, the original screw in here, it was lost to time. The swing, sling swivel here is all kinds of rusty, as you can see. Uh, I did put some oil on it to try to free it up a little bit, when I, but when I first got this, this entire sling swivel was just seized up by all kinds of crud, junk, whatever, rust. Um, so it's been there and done that. And you can see it's made out of the old original material, whatever they called it back in the day. Although this side looks a little bit cleaner, so it was probably stored on one side or the other. Um, and then on the inside of the the actual stock itself when I was assembling the lower, uh, there was like a yellowish kind of fiber material uh, inside of the tube that was uh, cracking and flaking away. So when uh, you, know, you take your finger and kind of run it inside there a little bit and little pieces would come off. So whatever that was, I hope I didn't inhale too much of it. But anyway, um, it was a bit of a bear to get the stock over the uh, bu uh, buffer tube here, which is a correct A1 length buffer tube. Didn't have to use a uh, a spacer or, or anything weird like that. Just used a you know regular A1 uh, stock screw there that I got, I believe, from Luff AR. And um, I had to really, really hammer on that thing to get that stock tube <laughs> to go down into the stock because there's just so much crud. And uh, like I said, that yellowish fiber stuff that was just flaking away on the inside there made it a bit of a, a bit of a pain. Um, but the stock has absolutely been there and done that. And I think that's super cool. The A1 grip, of course, is one of my favorite, like, kind of military-style grips, uh, if you want to call it military-style. All right, now, I don't want to use politically charged language, but there you go. Uh, this is the original material as well. It's got, like, the little flex and, and things in it, little imperfections. I mean, it's kind of hard to see there on the camera, but um, it is definitely original material. And there's some kind of, like, little tag, as you can see right there, inside of the, uh, the grip. I've opted to leave it in there because I figured that was probably put in there by some armorer like decades ago. So I'm just going to leave it in there. And it's a nice little like kind of retro piece, you know. And then of course the famous triangle handguards here. And these are uh, absolutely original too as you can see there. Uh, honestly they, they feel a little fragile, I, I'm not going to lie. Uh, they've got scuffs and dings all over it. Uh, they don't exactly quite fit <laughs> too well. They, they're a little wobbly. Um, you know, they, they, I mean, look at, look at the gap there at the bottom. Jeez, that is, uh, quite a gap. So, uh, when I was shooting this, um, I, I definitely noticed the heat come up here from the, uh, from the gas tube. I, I wrapped my hand around it, like put my thumb over top and I'm just 
holding the rifle. I'm like, dang, that's a, that's a little warm. Um, so, but original as well. It's got the heat shields on the inside, of course. And uh, yeah, and that is about all the original parts um, on this gun. Everything else I kind of put together from a uh, arrow precision, just standard, you know, uh, AR lower, nothing crazy. And I, I did that mostly because, you know, this, this gun was already going to be anachronistic anyways. Uh, so I figured, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll use, I'll use whatever works and looks close enough. So there you can see, yeah, standard, just regular carbine, or not carbine, uh, regular air precision lower there. The upper here, I believe I got this from either JSE surplus or uh, Luff AR. So I think I got it from Luff AR. Uh, fully assembled. Now this is the C7 style of upper because it has the brass deflector here and I opted for the teardrop shape uh, forward assist as well because I think the teardrop shape just looks a little bit more A1-ish, right? I know the, uh, the dust cover is probably not correct. Uh, I didn't bother to look that up, but this, this shell deflector is definitely a C7 uh, edition, which is totally fine by me. And the reason why that is is because, as people know if you've watched my channel, I am cross-eyed dominant, so I am right-handed. But being cross-eyed dominant, I have to shoot irons with my uh, left eye, so I shoot rifles left-handed. So if you've ever shot ARs that don't have a shell deflector here left-handed, it kind of sucks, to be honest. I have been hit in the face, uh, in the chin, uh, cheeks, you know, everywhere just uh, by random brass coming out of the gun. And you would think that the ejection port being how it is, the brass would just fly out like kind of in a straight line. It doesn't always sometimes. It really, really does depend on the ammo, gas system, buffer, all those things together. Um, you know, is, the, is, the, is mercury and retrograde kind of thing uh, to determine where the exact uh, ejection angle is. But with this deflector on here, because I knew I was going to shoot it left-handed, that makes a huge, huge difference. So make sure the, uh, the brass absolutely does not hit me in the face or anywhere else. So a little bit of addition that I wanted to do. Of course, a uh, standard charging handle here. I don't, I don't, I really, really don't like those, uh, the retro uh, triangle shaped ones for the very, very early M16s. Uh, honestly, I really don't like those. Uh, I've gotten hands on them a few times and I always felt like my fingers would just slide right off of it because I mean, it's shaped like a triangle, uh, not like a, a T-handle shape. So I went with that. Of course, standard A1 sights here. I've never actually used A1 sights before until I got this rifle and honestly, like, they, they are actually very simple to use. Uh, definitely a lot less to remember than like an A2 rear sight or an A4 carry handle, that kind of rear sight. Uh, a lot less to remember there. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so the chrome, actual chrome bolt carrier. Uh, I got this because I feel, I just, I really like the, the kind of the chrome look when the rest of the rifle is kind of black and uh, grayish looking. You know, the chrome adds a really, really nice touch. And on top of that, uh, chrome is an excellent, excellent finish for bolt carriers. I think Eugene Stoner absolutely got that right. <laughs> Dude knew, uh, knew what he was talking about. Um, I love this bolt carrier. I believe it's just a micro best. So nothing crazy, nothing fancy, uh, but it is a very, very good uh, bolt carrier and I've had great luck with it. And it, uh, it cleans up so, so well. I mean, it doesn't matter how many rounds I shoot, it just works perfectly. So cannot complain about that. Of course, uh, 20 round magazine, as is standard for A1s. That's what they issued them uh, with them back in the day. And of course, the A1 style just looks, you know, very, very complete with a 20 round mag. Now you could, of course, run your 30s and whatever other kind of magazines through this, no problem. And I didn't have any issues at all running like P mags through this. But to me, for the classic look, for peak aesthetic, okay, uh, you gotta run the 20 round magazines. So I'm hoping to get some uh, steel magazines actually to, to further you know, uh, add to the, the, the retro vibe because uh, originally they did have steel 20 round magazines for the M16s. They moved to aluminum later. Uh, what else? So the slip ring here, um, this is actually the only one they had at the store at the time. So I was like, man, sure, I'll buy it. And it was listed as their, their retro one. I guess it's because it's uh, gray colored. But anyway, that's the style of slip ring, delta ring that they used for the A1s. Uh, it's just a cylinder shape versus the uh, beveled ring that you would see with the A2 models uh, and such going forward. For the front end here, uh, we got the triangle end cap, which is correct, of course. Uh, a lot, some of the A2s, A3s, A4s would also use a triangle um, end cap as well. I mean, my own A4 upper has a triangle end cap, but there's also round end caps as well. 
Now the front sight is actually a little bit different from your A2s, A4s, because it's a five position uh, front sight there. It's kind of hard to see, but there there is definitely five notches in there versus the other uh, style, which is four. So that's why if you have like a AR front sight adjustment tool, there's one side that has four notches and the other side has five. And that's the reason why is because of this, the A1 style. Um, I have, don't really have a preference for either one. I mean, they, they do what they're supposed to do. They screw up and down depending on what you need for elevation. No big deal. Uh, standard bayonet lug here as well. It does actually fit my uh, M8 bayonet here, which is super cool because my M8 bayonet also fits the rest of my A2, A4 rifles and every other AR rifle that I have that has a bayonet lug. So that's pretty cool. Of course, uh, pencil profile barrel, which is a huge, huge difference in terms of weight. And this actually did come with a, I guess, uh, you could call it an A1 uh, bird cage, I guess, because as a lot of people know, some of the very first M16s had, of course, the uh, three, uh, bleh, three prong flash hider, uh, and then they changed to the bird cage one like this one. But they realized, uh, of course, through field trials and use and everything that the uh, ports being 360 all the way around uh, tended to kick up dust and dirt and everything else if you were shooting from a prone position. So of course that introduced the A2 birdcage, which is closed on the bottom to prevent that. But this one is appropriate for an A1. It is open all the way around, which honestly I didn't really notice a difference at all when I was shooting it. So then again, I don't really shoot prone, so that might be an issue at some point whenever I shoot this prone. Who knows? Maybe I'll go to one of those... Uh, service rifle uh, matches or something one day and uh, see see how that goes. But yeah, the uh, the barrel assembly itself I got from uh, H&R. So I am loath to give PSA money uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, I've got videos on why I don't really like them as a company because they kind of ticked me off a little bit and uh, they banned me from their <laughs> Facebook pages because I said their stuff isn't as good as they claim it is. Uh, and I had data to back that up, but anyway. Uh, there are only a few companies out there that still kind of manufacture all the retro stuff that uh, is very popular right now. And of course, PSA, uh, under the H&R Harrington and Richardson brand, of course, has a lot of those retro parts. So at the time, uh, there wasn't really a whole lot out there for a proper A1 style pencil profile barrel that I wanted. Now, I really didn't want to buy the one in 12 twist because I wanted my rifle to be able to shoot, you know, any uh, grainage of 5.56. Five, so I opted for the H&R one in seven pencil profile barrel that you see here. And uh, I gotta say, this thing's actually pretty darn good quality um, and uh, quite accurate too, as I found out. So that's pretty much the uh, parts there. The, uh, the trigger's just standard mil spec trigger, nothing crazy. But yeah, I just took all these parts together and uh, well, this is the result. So I have to say my initial impressions when I first got this was, um, gosh, this thing is so lightweight. Like when I, when I picked it up, I was like, this feels like a toy, honestly. Like I, I could really understand the impressions that the, the, the soldiers in Vietnam first um, got when they were handed these things because you know they were used to lugging around like M1 Garrett's, M1 carbines. Heck, I think an M1 carbine is probably heavier than this. Um, you know, M14s, right? And you hand them something like this, which it just doesn't weigh anything. And it's got all this plastic and fiberglass and aluminum and stuff on it. You're just like, what the heck is this, man? Like, <laughs> is this actually a real rifle? You know, uh, I could definitely see where the troops were coming from, you know? But uh, yeah, this thing is absurdly light for like a you know 20 inch barrel AR like this, even with a pencil profile, right? Dude, this thing just doesn't weigh anything. I could absolutely see myself uh, carrying this in the field all day long and um, you know no no problem at all put your standards a little sling on there you know um, bayonet whatever you know 20 round magazines which is which are of course lighter than 30 round magazines uh, you know and you got a very handy lightweight package that is uh, still very capable I mean I mean heck we see troops today operating with like you know their uh, super shorty Mark 18 carbines, your uh, M4 carbines and stuff like that. And they're still bodying people, right? Uh, at respectable distances. Imagine what you could do with a full length 20 inch barrel. I mean, heck, even the, the Mark 12s are only 18 inches, right? So uh, full 20 inch barrel to get the full potential out of a 5.56 five, round. I mean, 
I, I would feel pretty pretty adequately armed with a A1 M16 in the Vietnam era and uh, beyond. So, but yeah, this is definitely ultra lightweight. Uh, it makes a huge difference. I mean, even versus an A2, an A2 is not even that heavy, uh, you know, relatively speaking, right? This is still lighter than an A2 by, uh, by a good bit. Uh, it's very noticeable. So this thing is absolutely awesome. And of course, too, we can't uh, talk about A1s without talking about the stock. The A1 stock is, of course, a shorter length of pull, which I, I honestly, I don't mind. Um, me being six foot, it, it's, I actually prefer the A2 uh, st style of stock, just because it's a little bit longer. For me, it feels a little more comfortable. This is a little more, more crowded, like my arms feel a little kind of, I have to press them in a little bit more to, to get a nice comfortable hold. But um, I guess practically speaking, it doesn't really make it that much of a difference. But I know a lot of people do kind of prefer the A1 style uh, length of stock, yeah, uh, once they try it, of course, versus an A2. Now, I imagine someone who's much shorter than me, maybe like a, I don't know, a short female, uh, maybe like 5'3", five, 5'4", five, okay, could probably really appreciate the A1 style stock a lot more than me, which is totally fine, you know. Uh, of course, all that gets overwritten now by the fancy carbines with their, you know, telescoping stocks and stuff like that. But, you know, for an average service rifle like this with a thick stock, it's not bad at all, honestly. It's very serviceable. Um, okay, so for how it's shot and accuracy, I mean... It's a 20 inch rifle length uh, gas system. It's gonna shoot great. Um, and the best part is too, so I, uh, I've i never used A1 sights, of course, right? Uh, didn't really know how to zero them or anything like that. So I watched uh, Paul Harrell's video on how to zero your A1 and A2 and by extension A4 style of uh, rifles. And um, I followed his, his instructions for the A1 side to the letter. And I was very, very surprised. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was very surprised that the information he gave out was extremely accurate. So uh, when I did all the mechanical zero and everything, uh, went up to 25 yards on a bench, it was dead on. I was like, dude, that's freaking awesome. So uh, the old information definitely still applies to even modern production stuff like this. Even uh, a barrel and an upper from two different companies, you know, just slapped together, uh, it still works just fine. <laughs> So uh, once I did that, did my fine adjustments, uh, I had to move the windage just a teeny bit, and I wasn't sure if that was just me or the wind that day, uh, but I did get it on target eventually. However, uh, Paul Harrell was also correct in stating that uh, if you zero this for 25, you'll be on at 300, of course, but you know, pretty close, uh, but you'll be very high at uh, 100 or 150, which I definitely found to be the case. So uh, of course I had to use the, uh, the short range uh, aperture versus the long range which, as he explains in the video, the only difference between those two is, of course, the elevation change between them. So I uh, moved it down to the short range aperture, and I found it was still hitting pretty, pretty high. So uh, I've got some targets here that I will show, that uh, will show, um, you know, uh, to the accuracy and also kind of where it was hitting and where I was aiming. All right, so this is all at 100 yards, and I used all kinds of different ammo, um, lightweight ammo, like 52 grain bullets, 55, 68s, uh, 75s. Uh, I think I even tried some 77s, but anyway. Um, so here we have 75 grain uh, frontier. So this is like their uh, match, I guess. So this is probably the best group I got at 100 yards. And as you can see, I have uh, one flyer here. And yes, that is just me. Yes, that is very annoying when that happens. But this here is a sub MOI group. Uh, and actually fairly centered, but just very high. And I was aiming about here uh, with the front sight. So still hitting quite high at 100 yards, but dang, dude, that's some, uh, that's some pretty nice accuracy out of that. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but uh, it just shows the, the uh, potential of this rifle. So uh, here we got another big target here. So this is my very first group at 100 that I was doing, 52 grain Black Hills match, match ammo. I was aiming right at the center of this circle here, and it was hitting way the heck up here. So uh, it was hitting quite high. And then I remembered, of course, I needed to put the short range aperture um, on instead of the long range one. So I flipped it to short range and tried again. But just this goes to show you, with long range aperture, me cutting this circle in half is hitting way the heck up here. So, I mean, if it was a man-sized target, right? If, if I put it somewhere on his chest or his belly, it'd still hit somewhere up here in this area uh, where the vitals are, of course. Um, so, you know, for a combat rifle, it'll work. 
so here's is the second group, and, th and this one is really, really nice. As you can see here, still 52 grain, uh, Black Hills match ammo. And uh, this is when I discovered that the windage was just off just a teeny bit. So I had to move it uh, just one click and uh, got it centered after that. But, uh, you know, that's four shots right there. And, of course, a fifth, a flyer. And this, yes, that is just me. Yes, that is very annoying when that happens. <laughs> so the theme of the day seems to be one flyer that ruins my whole group. But, again, another sub MOA group. Fantastic. The rest of the groups of the day, though, weren't all that great. Uh, I mean, we're talking, like, maybe, like, two inches or so. Uh, here's another group for 52 grand Black Hills match. Not my best. Again, another one that's way out there. Hmm. Uh, this one here is Hornady 55 grain FMJ, just their standard whatever crap stuff. Uh, it was a little hard to hold on target here, so I tried to aim for these circles down here. Uh, and of course it was hitting high. So not the most consistent uh, hold for my sight picture, which probably contributed to a little bit of the uh, inaccuracy. Um, and of course on this side, another group of 55 grain Hornady. Really nothing to write home about. Um, I think, I think honestly, the, me the mechanical accuracy of the rifle is uh, well proven at this point. So I put about 150, 160 rounds uh, in one sitting through this gun uh, just to put it through its paces and try it out and everything, and it worked great. So no, no feeding issues, no reliability issues, no jams, nothing. Worked perfectly. So... Given the, uh, the groups and everything that I saw from this rifle, um, really any, any deviation from small groups that are small tight groups like that is probably just me. I mean, I, I bet if I could get some kind of scope on here, I'd probably tighten that up just a little bit. But of course, that is the nature of shooting with iron sights. Uh, you know, I'm not a, not a super duper ultra match competition iron sight shooter. You know, I'm not, I'm not that good. Uh, and of course, this is my first time using uh, A1 style sights. And the, uh, the front sight post is, is, of course, different from an A2. So uh, getting used to that. And then, of course, you know, standard mil-spec trigger, nothing crazy. None of this, like, LaRue or Geisley type triggers or anything like that. Just standard mil-spec trigger, kind of heavy, single stage, right? Um, all that taken together, I think, I think this rifle is quite accurate. Uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very, very uh, satisfied with the performance of it. And, and even, like, after shooting all of those rounds, like, I, di I didn't really let this this rifle sit and cool like I was chugging through those rounds pretty quick and um, I thought about that because I was like man they always say like pencil barrels are gonna when they heat up they're gonna lose all this accuracy they're gonna go all over the place and they're gonna you know barrel whips around and does all this stuff well I was shooting at a pretty good clip uh, no pun intended and uh, I, I didn't notice any difference honestly when this thing was cold versus when it was hot now granted like I said it was only 150 160 rounds so not cosmic but uh Definitely not letting it sit, you know, between every single round, wait five minutes for the barrel to cool off and shoot it again. No, I don't, I don't do that kind of shooting. I don't have the, the time or patience for that, frankly. And it's a little ridiculous because, uh, you know, unless you're like testing the absolute mechanical accuracy, there's never going to be a practical time where you're just going to sit there and shoot one shot every five minutes. It's just not going to happen. So anyway, so overall, the whole process of putting this thing together uh, finding the parts, sourcing the parts, putting it together, um, you know, just having an A1 style rifle and being really, really impressed with its performance, accuracy, shootability, uh, shooting experience, and um, just everything taken together. It's really, really easy to see why like this was so, I guess, I would say popular, uh, you know, and how it evolved into the A2 and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, at the time, probably it wasn't as appreciated as much as it should have been. Uh, for active like duty service, I could definitely see why these handguards got changed out because even for me, these things feel a little flimsy and I, I feel like if I was banging around with this like in a, in a vehicle or a helicopter or something like that and I hit something pretty hard here, it would absolutely break these. Um, and then of course the left and right side, you have to get the left and right side. It's not just the round handguards that are the top and the bottom that are uh, symmetrically shaped, right? Um, and all those things, all the upgrades of the A2, brought with it but there is absolutely nothing wrong with an a1 style rifle like this i mean just this just oozes classic you know uh, i showed this to my dad too and, and i was like hey bring back some memories and he's like yeah it does yeah it does um but yeah i, I really wanted to see for myself what an a1 style rifle was like my buddy was was absolutely not wrong you know saying how lightweight it is how handy it is how easy it is to shoot um, it, it's just a very, very practical rifle, in my opinion. And, 
well suited for the time that it came out and for the conflict that it was well, pretty much designed for. So, yeah, and of course it started a whole legacy of AR style rifles that we have now today and uh, continues to evolve. And uh, yeah, it's really, it's really nice to kind of go back and, and, and kind of experience it how it all started, you know, more or less. So, like I said, I know this isn't the most accurate A1 uh, ever, but that wasn't really my goal. I just wanted an A1-like, A1 style of rifle. So, very, very handy, very nice. So, I definitely encourage you, if you have not tried an A1 style rifle before, or really, like, honestly, just any kind of, like, pencil barrel 20-inch AR rifle length gas system like this, you should give it a shot and uh, kind of try it for yourself, you know, because it... it it is a phenomenal weight difference. This thing is just, man, I, I could like toss this thing, work out with it and stuff, and just not, not feel anything at all. Not, not like an A4, which is like a freaking boat anchor compared to this. God, uh, that, that, that huge quad rail on there with all the extra fixings and optics and uh, you know, fancy modern doodads and stuff. God, that, that thing weighs a freaking ton and a half versus this being a nice little, little featherweight. So Absolutely pleasurable experience. Uh, I think Eugene Stunner absolutely knew what he was doing with this. And uh, I can absolutely agree with some of his points when he was saying uh, some of the stuff they did to the A2 and the A4 rifles was completely unnecessary, uh, not needed. I 100% agree. Uh, you know, me being a service member myself, if I was going to be issued a rifle back then, I would absolutely want an A1 over an A2 any day of the week. Uh, but I would feel uh, very capably armed with either or. So... Uh, I'm a little unfortunate that, uh, you know, I, I never got to really experience an A1 in a military sense, but, um, you know, oh, well, at least I got to experience the A2, which is going to come uh, after this video. So I have my A2 upper, I've got my A4 upper as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of on a um, <laughs> military uh, issued rifle kind of kick right now. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a whole lot of fun. So yeah, if you can put together your your own A1 or maybe even just buy a pre-built A1, I mean, H&R has got them out the wazoo right now. Uh, I'm sure the Brownells ones are very, very nice too. But uh, I, I frankly don't really see a reason for the 1 in 12 twist unless you really want to be a purist about it. But then at that point, it's like, are you, are you really getting it more for like a collector's sake or something you can actually shoot? And uh, I'm always more for something you can actually shoot. So, yeah. Um, yeah. This has been a uh, really, really fun experience, and I definitely encourage y'all to try an A1 at some point. But anyway, that's all I got to say about that. And uh, A2 is going to come up next, and uh, we'll do some comparison video too uh, as well. Because yeah, that seems to be a pretty popular topic right now. But uh, yeah, just figured I'd uh, share this one with y'all. And uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.